everybody, James Hershaw here for your impact review for April 12th, 2018. Uh, show opens up with Eli Drake coming out with the Feaster Fired, both Feaster Fired briefcases, one for the tag team titles and one for the world title. Right now he's interested in what's coming out of that tag team title. Uh, LAX comes out, they want to know who his partner's going to be. Um, and he does not make them wait long because the big bad booty daddy himself comes out. Eli Drake's in a tough position in, in something like this because, uh, because he is not, he does not have a usual tag team partner. Uh, he does not have somebody he knows or is comfortable with. And it takes, to be a great tag team, you have to have somebody you're comfortable with. Or perhaps you team up with someone who is such a tag team specialist that they don't need a, a, a good, well-known partner. I'm sure that uh, Scott Steiner can work with almost anyone, and that's why he chose him. He chose someone who he knew uh, could help him become a tag, or become a tag team quickly, um, and I think that was a good choice. Um, but LAX thinks maybe Scott Steiner's just there for the payday. He asks whether he still has it. And so I guess we'll have to wait and see whether does Scott Steiner still have it? Can he still run with the best in tag team wrestling? Uh, and he's going to make Eli and Scott Steiner prove that at the upcoming pay-per-view. Uh, Scott Steiner, always an interesting figure, immediately calls the fans bitches, immediately calls them white trash rednecks. The only thing he didn't say was that they were fat, but I suppose that's coming later in the show. Uh, an interesting dust-up between these two, interested in the match coming up, interesting to see if Scott Steiner really can prove himself uh, and, and uh, help Eli Drake win the tag team titles from a cohesive unit, very cohesive unit, like LAX. Next on the list, uh, it was OVE versus Moose. Listen, um... I know the guys from OVE. I'm from Ohio. They're from Ohio. Um, I want to defend them, but I can't. So, look, we knew way, the way this match was going to go. Moose was going to go one-on-one, -on -one, but it wouldn't stay that way for long. Uh, and it didn't. All of OVE came in and started attacking him, and Moose cannot win three versus one. It's just not possible. Um... Listen, like I said, I like these guys, but they are assholes. Um, <laughs> I know that firsthand. Uh, one time uh, they were supposed to pick me up for a show and uh, didn't, didn't let me know I was actually standing out in the rain for about 35, 45 minutes before I got a, a text saying that they were not going to be able to pick me up. Um, and I missed that show, missed my payday, $125, and uh, I have a sore spot, but I cannot say too much bad about them. Um, listen, they were, Eddie Edwards come out, came out, they brought out the baseball bat, Eddie Edwards couldn't fight all three of them, obviously, they're about to stretch him out and beat him in the eye with that baseball bat again, terrible, terrible thing to do, and Eddie Edwards' wife comes out to plead, and that's got to be a blow for Eddie Edwards when he wakes up and realizes that his wife had to defend him. He, uh, this is, this is brewing to be something very terrible between these two. Uh, this is going to be an interesting match because these guys actually hate each other, and Eddie Edwards has so much to prove by beating them. But they were going to, I think they maybe were going to hit his wife. I, I have to believe that these guys have more sense than that, that they were just threatening, they wouldn't have actually done it, but it didn't matter because the lights in the arena went out, and Tommy Dreamer shows up when they come back on, and Tommy had the kendo stick in hand, and these guys were not ready for that, they were not ready for the, getting hit with the kendo stick, and they scattered out of the ring, um, there was a pile driver involved, so it looks like... Um, maybe, uh, three versus three, uh, between these guys, and, you, you know, 
people ask, well, you know, why would why would Tommy Dreamer come out to defend these guys? And really, it's not doesn't have anything to do with them defending these guys in particular. It has to do with everybody seems to want to beat OVE's ass. They think they're assholes. They want to be a part of the team that destroys them. And so I think that's more of what it is. Tommy Dreamer doesn't necessarily want to defend Eddie Edwards and Moose. He wants to kick OVE's ass. I can't blame him. And then we have Petey Williams versus Josh Matthews. Um, Josh Matthews didn't look good in this match, but we have, to, we have to ask ourselves why would he get involved in this in the first place. He comes out and cuts a promo and says that basically Petey Williams is the reason uh, why he lost his titles, and Petey Williams has been, he's been a roadblock um, for him and Seidel. So he wants to, like I said in one of my previous videos, Josh Matthews and Matt Seidel are close friends. That's why, that's why they're going out there and defending one another. And even though Seidel knows that Josh Matthews can't beat someone like Petey Williams on a normal day, he will, he will accept that he's going to get into a match like that because he knows that Josh Matthews is doing it for him. He knows that he's doing it because he's a friend and an ally and he wants to show his support. So Matt Seidel will obviously let him do that and be there for him. And let's, you know, that, that gives Petey Williams some pause because Petey Williams has to go out there knowing that circling around the ring is a very, very good wrestler, a wrestler with the X Division title, somebody who's proved themselves in the ring. And uh, Petey Williams went out there anyway. And, and like I said, um, Josh Matthews didn't look good. Um, he, he showed himself as very amateurish. You know, he, he used to be a professional wrestler. Uh, that part of his career was cut short. And he's and you can see that he's not he's not been training obviously for this. He doesn't have the 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 strengths of of wrestling. He doesn't have the strengths of impact. His punches were weak that he was throwing. He uh, he he doesn't have good mat wrestling. Just all around, really, the only chance he had in this match is if Petey Williams vastly underestimated him. Maybe he got a roll up or something, or hit him with a with a move that he wasn't expecting, knock him out for a little while, or if Seidel was going to get an interference, um, he eventually would interfere and the the ref would call for the bell, but. Um, yeah, Josh Matthews never had a chance, but the reason he's doing it is he's not doing it to win. He's doing it to prove a point that he is Seidel's friend. And if you find somebody like that in the business, like I said, you stick close to them. Because friendship is vitally important in professional wrestling. Uh, I wanted to talk about next was this package for Brian Cage. Um, Brian Cage has been... He's in. He's been in these matches with standby wrestlers for the past couple of weeks, and I get a lot of questions about this. Why do? Why does it seem like these big, strong guys are always getting in matches with these standby wrestlers, these wrestlers that we've never seen, that we don't know? Um, I want to explain this. It, it's. It's not that the management thinks that these standby wrestlers can win or that they have a chance. What they're doing is is building a fervor in the fans' heart. What they're doing is um, they're showing... The management knows exactly what Brian Cage can do. But they want to show the fans what he can do. Look how destructive he can be. Look how fast he can defeat an opponent. It's building up this idea that he is a monster of an individual. So that when he gets into a match with a real opponent, with a real professional, then we will we will want to know, well, is he gonna keep doing that? Is he gonna is he gonna be the same? Is it gonna is it gonna be just that much of a of a, of a domination? Um so they it's it, they know. They know what's going on, they know what's gonna happen. But it's just it's just an idea from management that that we're gonna build this guy up. Now 
Here's the real question. Why would these standby wrestlers get into the ring with somebody they know is going to destroy them? And the answer is that simple. Money and exposure. Uh, when you're in a, a position like that as a standby wrestler, that's the best thing you can do. And if it takes an ass kicking to do it, well, then they, some of them might say it's worth it. Uh, Johnny Impact comes out and does an interview interrupted by Congo Kong. Um, looks like they might have a match soon. Uh, not much to say there. And then, this was interesting. Trevor Lee, Caleb Connolly, KM versus Falaba, Richard Justice, and Tyrus. Uh, Richard Justice is another one of these standby wrestlers. Uh, the crux of this match was that Trevor Lee and uh, the rest of the cult of Lee do not respect Falaba, Richard Justice, and Tyrus because they are large individuals. And in fact, they have been sort of picking on Richard Justice lately because he is a large individual. And you get this a lot uh, from certain professional wrestlers who, who look at a larger guy, a guy with no muscle mass or structure, and they don't respect them because to them it, it seems like they are getting to where they are based on their size alone. They haven't put any work in, they're not technically proficient at wrestling, and they have let their size, you know, the bigger you are, the harder you are to take down. Sure, you're slower, but if you can, you know, you're, you're, the weight behind your strikes are going to be better. All you have to do is land on someone, and it's more crushing of a defeat. Um, I mean, Falaba off the top is going to be is going to be a harder hit than somebody like Rey Mysterio off the top, even though it's easier for somebody like Rey Mysterio to come off the top. So, these Cult of Lee guys, they do not respect the fact that they see these larger wrestlers have not put in the work. I think they're wrong about that. I think that the larger wrestlers obviously still have to put in a lot of work in order to be successful in professional wrestling, but... Uh, the, they did not think so, so this is where this match came to be. Um, here's one thing I did want to say, you know, that management lets these kind of things turn into matches. Um, matches should be based on who you, on who who's a better wrestler. Um, we figure out who's a better wrestler because we want to see who gets a title shot. To, this is sort of a backstage disagreement, and the fact that management would turn this into a match, I think, is a it's a it's a bow for the morale backstage because whoever wins, they can they can sort of continue that backstage, and if if uh, the cult of Lee they would have won, what does that mean for the larger wrestlers? Does that mean that they that they have to take this abuse? Management needs to be careful with these kind of matches, but I understand why it took place. Um, Falaba definitely used his weight to his advantage in this match. This is what the Cult of Lee was trying to say. But look, they should be faster. They should be able to avoid these things, and they didn't. Um, mostly, this match was completely on the side of, of Richard Justice, Falaba, and Tyrus. The only time that the Cult of Lee really was able to mount an offense was when Richard Justice was in the ring. And he is a standby wrestler. He is not as strong as as the other wrestlers on the roster. He's not trained enough. He's not skilled enough. So he was getting the brunt of the offense. But once he was able to tag in uh, Tyrus, Tyrus was able to clean house. And this was uh, mostly completely on their side. Uh, Tyrus cleans house, tags in Falaba. Falaba comes off the top and is able to get the win. And uh, I guess the, the Cult of Lee needs to do some more training. And for the main event, we had the Demon's Dance match, which is basically just a hardcore match. Anything goes inside, outside the ring, weapons. And it was versus Valkyrie... Tyra, Va Tyra Valkyrie and Rosemary. Rosemary, a huge fan favorite. I'm seeing so many people in the audience with her makeup on. Boys, girls, mostly younger kids. 
But people love this this girl, and I gotta say, I really like her too. She is kind of hot. Um, she's she came to the ring, and uh, and she's got that crazy look to her. I really like that. Taya Valkyrie, very good looking girl too. She's very strong looking. Um, I wasn't sure where this match was gonna go. I obviously would give it to to. Um, to Rosemary only because it was her match, it was her idea, and so she knew what she was getting into. Um, started out, and pretty much this was not a wrestling match, this was a almost like a street fight, and in a and just like clubbing blows, I'd almost give it to Taya because she's a she is a larger woman, um, but that's not the only thing it was. Um, we had people going out on the ramp. Um, we had we had chairs Valkyrie um, really crushing spot when Valkyrie picks up Rosemary and lays her over the guardrail right in front of her fans <laughs> as a matter of fact um, and then she goes around the ring and starts throwing chairs in uh, not one chair not two chairs like six chairs I think it almost it was um, and is able to uh, start using them, but they're still brawling. Uh, Valkyrie slams a chair right between Rosemary's legs, almost like a uh, like a humiliation tactic in this match. Um, Rosemary gets a, a ladder. Rosemary gets a table. Um, the <laughs> these girls were throwing everything at one another uh, to try to to try to prove who was the best. Um, and Valkyrie really was holding her own, even though I would say she was probably more proficient as a technical wrestler. So that's where kind of she was falling apart in this match, is that with the weapons and the brawling, eventually Rosemary's going to come on top because she's... it's For this match, it's not who can, who can give the most offense. It's who can take the most offense. Who can take the most pain? And even though Taya is strong, Rosemary obviously can take more pain than she can because Taya Valkyrie was able to be on the offensive more times than Rosemary during this match, but Rosemary was able to just keep coming back. She doesn't care if you hit her with a chair. She doesn't care if you, if you uh, throw her over a ring post. She does not care about these things. She will take that and keep coming at you. Uh, eventually, they set up the table, and they fight on the top rope, and they, they're trying to trade what their finishers are going to be, um, but they keep blocking them, and it's a very death-defying sort of, sort of tense moment as they're both trying to push each other through that table. And it, it looks like they've almost given up, and Ty Valkyrie's about to just push her off into the table. But Rosemary is able to turn it into a pile driver through the table, and Taya is in no way getting up from that. Rosemary gets the one, two, three with a pile driver through the table and is able to win the Demon's Dance match. Um, but a fantastic match between these two ladies. Looked great, and it was a good main event. Guys, this uh, impact was was... Was really good. Good matches. Um, they did not specifically address the fact that Alberto El Patron was left has left the company, but they did have a package that built towards the new main event, and uh, I think that's a good way to do it. Look, um, I thought I think Alberto thought that. It wasn't going to be such a big deal, him no showing that event. He said, you know, it's not on TV, it's just a it's just a Twitch presentation, it's just a local thing, it doesn't matter. But I don't think he really understands, and this happens with, with an older gentleman, he doesn't understand the power and the the impact of of something like a Twitch production, which is in front of the eyes of of the whole world and not just on your local TV station. He didn't. I don't think he understood the consequences of what would happen if if he if he no showed an event like this. He did it for a better position against Aries, Mind Games, 
put him in a match against guys that that he's going to obviously get beat by if they team up against him. Um, but he didn't really understand that this is this was a big deal. This Lucha Underground versus Impact was a huge deal, and he needed to be there. Uh, and that cost him. It cost him a job. So he'll have to find someone somewhere else. Uh, good at episode of Impact. Looking forward to the next one, and we'll give you our review when it comes. See you later, everybody.